honored to introduce our speaker today, Professor Orit Rosin from Tel Aviv University, um, my former colleague. Orit Rosin is an associate professor in the Department of Jewish History at Tel Aviv University. She has published widely on Israel's citizenship, legislation, and uh, jurisprudence, immigration, gender issues, and family life. In recent years, she has been assessing Israel's political and security problems from the perspective of the history of emotion, and this is what she will going to talk today about. Uh, so her book, uh, forthcoming book, Israel 1949-1967, will be published by Oxford University um, by Oxford University Press in June 2020, uh, 2024, and. Um, the title is Emotion of Conflict, Israel, 1949-1967. Please join me in welcoming Orit Rosin. Um, on February 5, 1951, an armed Palestinian crossed the border into Israeli territory near Jerusalem and broke into the home of a couple of new immigrants from Hungary which was located on the edge of the emptied Arab village of Malcha. He murdered the husband, raped his wife, and stripped the house of its valuables before escaping back across the border into Jordan. Following the 1948 war, the ceasefire lines between Israel and its neighbors remained porous. Most of the Palestinian refugees who made their way into Israel were not violent. Some returned to their former homes to take belongings they had left behind, others to cultivate their fields or bring in their harvests. But their presence caused deep fear among Jewish civilians living in border regions, many of whom were new immigrants who had been settled on the land or in villages left empty by Palestinians who had fled or been expelled. The phen phenomenon of Palestinian border crossing was called histanenut, infiltration, by Israelis and by foreign diplomats. It was a pejorative term connoting trespass, entering other people's property without their permission. Following the incident in Malcha, and over the objections of the general staff of the Israel Defense Forces, Prime Minister and Defense Minister David Ben-Gurion ordered an attack on Sharafat, a village in Jordan, which lay just beyond Israeli-controlled Jerusalem's southwestern border, from which the killer, or perhaps killers, had set out, but cautioned the IDF to avoid engaging soldiers of the Arab Legion, Jordan's army. On the night of February 6, an Israeli military force entered the village and blew up two houses, one of them, the, the home of the village chief, the Muhtar. The Jordanian army reported nine killed, including three women and five children aged one to 13 and eight wounded, including five children and three women. The ongoing cycle of violence aroused various emotions. In this talk, I will focus mainly on fear, insecurity, and despair on the one hand, and on anger and the thirst for revenge on the other. But first, some background. In the aftermath of the 1948 war, Israel had difficulty providing citizens with security in their daily lives. The government signed armistice agreements with the country's Arab neighbors, but these did not lead to a peace treaty. Palestinian refugees prevented from returning to their homes lived on the other side of Israel's borders in the Arab countries, all of them hostile to Israel, a situation that continued with ups and downs throughout the country's first two decades. Israeli civilians living close to the conv convoluted armistice borders were especially vulnerable. In addition, the leadership and the public feared the likelihood of a second round, another all-out war against the Arab armies. In particular, after the Czechoslovakian-Egyptian arms deal in September 1955, and once again in May 1967, following the massive military buildup 
of Egyptian forces and the removal of the UN task force from the demilitarized Sinai Peninsula leading up to the Six-Day War. While the Jewish-Israeli public gained a short-lived sense of security after the Sinai campaign, the victory in Sinai did not change anything on the Syrian border at the foot of the Golan Heights. Border incidents with Syria had been routine since the two countries signed an armistice agreement in July 1959, mainly as a result of differing interpretations of its provisions. From 1965, Syria also permitted Fatah to operate along its borders with Israel. Nearly 120 attacks of the, or attempted attacks from Syria were staged against Israel during the 18 months preceding the 1967 war. Most of the assailants succeeded in returning to their bases unharmed. Both before and after the Sinai War, Israel had no good means of preventing Palestinian militants from crossing the borders and carrying out their plans. The question I wanted to answer in my forthcoming book, Emotions of Conflict, is how Israelis of this time operating within a particular ideological and political framework coped with the challenges of living in a country that was meant to provide existential security to the Jewish people and a sense of safety to its citizens, but had difficulty doing so. At the book center is the way the Jewish national community managed its emotions vis-a-vis -vis the conflict. I consider the Arab minority principally as it was perceived by the majority group, although their emotions are also partially addressed. Emotions are experienced and interpreted in the context of a given culture. In the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict, each of the nations involved nurtures not only its own particular judgments about and moral perspective of the conflict, but also a different emotional culture. In this talk, I focus only on the Israeli Jews, so from here on, for the sake of brevity, I will refer to them simply as Israelis. The questions of what emotions are has long been a concern of scholars in fields ranging across the natural, social, and human sciences. Overall, Ute Freivert maintains, historians consider emotions to be human artifacts that are deeply embedded in culture and thus open to historical change. Even if they are hardwired in the human brain and coordinated with physiological processes in the human body, they are first and foremost shaped by culture. William Reddy, whose groundbreaking work shows how emotions are understood in the contexts of specific cultures and in con connection with significant historical events, argues that any enduring political regime must establish as an es essential element a normative order for emotions, an emotional regime. This, he says, is a set of normative emotions and the official rituals, practices, and emotives that express and inculcate them. I use Reddy's term, emotional regime, as the organizing axis of the book. The cultural repertoire that emerged among the Jewish Zionist minority during the Mandate period was subsumed by the State of Israel in 1948. The emotional norms of the political, economic, and cultural elite continued to be central to Israeli society during the first two decades following independence. This culture was f fed by stories of heroism from World War II and of resolute courage displayed by British and Soviet civilians. The emotional regime the elite sought to inculcate in all Israelis was aimed at building a resilient population and establishing the emotional and behavioral norms towards the Arab enemy. I will now present two different kinds of security threats Israelis face and how their fears were addressed. The fear of Palestinian infiltration and the fear of total war. The tribulations of Kfar Azaria, a Moshava communal village on the southern coastal plain near Ramle, which had a large immigrant population, I described in a letter that its security sent 
it's, I'm, I'm sorry, its secretary sent to the Jewish Agency Security Department in January 1951. For two months, the residents had been plagued by a wave of theft by Palestinians who broke into their homes, as a result of which the Mushav's men were compelled to, to do guard duty every, every other night. The, th the situation, he wrote, caused depression and despair. And one of the oldest members of the Mushav had even moved to the city. Tension is very high, he continued, describing the cries and bitter wailing of the residents, which increase every time they hear a shot fired into the air, and the atmosphere becomes unbearable. In October 1953, an operations officer from the IDF Southern Command expressed a similar critique. Not only had the security needs of the immigrants not been provided for, these people feel that they have been neglected and abandoned to their fate. Such was the terror felt by the immigrants living on the borders that they tended to shut themselves up in their homes after dark, sometimes a few families crowding together and sleeping in one small house, as reported by the immigrants themselves and by, by counselors who worked in close contact with them. Policymakers in the fields of security and settlement were aware of the emotional burden imposed on inhabitants of the border areas, and as the economic situation improved, supplied fences, lighting, and telephone lines, and hired guards to patrol the settlements at night. At the same time, soldiers, teachers, counselors, and civilian volunteers mobilized in an effort to turn the threatened population into true Israelis who could display fortitude, self-control, and self-confidence. For example, women counselors who sought to instill the Israeli way of life in immigrant women also served as a model of the co correct emotional culture. While the immigrants cowered in their house houses after dark, the counselors went out to make home visits, showing them that fear of infiltrators should not keep them in their homes. When there was a threat of war with the Arab countries, all Israelis needed to manage their fears. In late September of 1955, Nasser announced a large-scale arms deal with Czechoslovakia, which turned out to include advanced arms that the IDF had no match for. The banner, banner headline in Dava, the popular labor movement daily, on October 2nd was, Nasser declares that the Czech arms are directed against Israel. The editorial warned that the Egyptian ruler and the other Arab rulers maintain that it is their right to deprive Israel of its capacity for self-defense, just as they reject our state's very existence and right to exist. The ordinary Israeli citizen does not sleep nights, wrote Rochel Oyerbach in an article she published in Davar in January 1956. Oyerbach, a historian and survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto, was a fairly prominent public figure who had in March 1954 been named head of the Yad Vashem's Department of Survivor Testimonies. Due to her war experience, she sought to instruct Israelis on how to manage their emotions and their behavior. There is no poison for the soul like tension that cannot be discharged with purposeful and cathartic action. There is no need to cause panic, but neither should people be allowed to grasp at the anesthetic of false hopes or the sedating drugs of fatalist insens insensibility. The feeling of fear, the recognition of danger, they have a biological intentional role that should not be obscured, but the energy it engenders needs to be turned in the best direction. Both Moshe Sharet and David Ben-Gurion, who returned to being prime minister in November 1955, fostered the pioneer ethos of volunteerism for the sake of the national goals. 
In the wake of the arms deal, Israelis volunteered in particular for two national efforts. Keren Hamager, the defense fund set up to collect citizen donations for IDF armament, and the construction of fortifications in the country's border regions. These were, at least in part, spontaneous grassroots projects that demonstrated the public's willingness to make personal sacrifices for the general good and to defend their homeland. These projects also served as constructive emotional outlets, but while emerging from below, both were quickly taken over by the state. The emotional effect of volunteering was clear. For example, many vol volunteers who took part in the border fortifi fortification project reported a sense of elation co caused both by the beauty of their natural surroundings and by the danger they were confronting, which intensified when there was an actual attack by Arab militants. Volunteers also reported positive feelings arising from the friendship and solidarity both among the volunteers and between them and the local inhabitants, as well as a sense of purpose, fulfillment, and belonging to something larger than themselves. As one of them related, they felt that they had become part of a grand historical narrative leading from the exodus through the rebuilders of Jerusalem's walls in the days of Nehemiah to the Warsaw Ghetto rebels and the warriors of the War of Independence. I now turn from fear and acts of de defense to emotions related to military aggression, anger, and a thirst for revenge. Although I am dealing with a past long forgotten, I believe this aspect of the conflict is particularly relevant at this present moment. So let us return to the story I opened with. Following the reprisal raid on Sharafat, at a meeting of the Knesset's Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee on February 12, Ben-Gurion responded to questions about Israel's reaction to Arab infiltrate, infiltrators. So it's a long quote, and I'll read it because it's important from, to show you. I'm going to discuss it much later on. We capture a regular infiltrator and send him back. But if he uses a weapon, we shoot him. If there is a severe case of murder or robbery, there is an aggressive response, and that is a fixed policy. Because there is no way of bringing a violent infiltrator who has escaped to trial. If there is a severe case of infiltration accompanied by murder or burglary or rape, then there is response, there is a response, either against an infiltrator himself or against the place he set out from, because we more or less know where the infiltrators come from. The Sharafat matter was not done by irregular forces. It was done with my knowledge. We do not do such things joyfully. But if the infiltrators come from a place, and we know that they come from there, and they murder the husband, rape the wife, and rob the house, we cannot remain silent. We must first ensure the security of the borders and the security of our settlements. There is a need to be more severe in cases like that, because we do not want there to be things like there were in Sharafat. Either they, meaning the Jordanians, will take responsibility for watching their people, or we will take action in response, but security first. Here, Ben-Gurion laid out his rules for proportionate punishment of Arab infiltrators who entered Israeli territory. He no doubt had in mind Minister of Justice Pinchas Rosen's reservations about the operations voiced at a cabinet meeting a few days earlier, which I will refer to shortly. In the Knesset, members of his own Mapai party, such as Beba Idelson, expressed shock at the large number of civilian casualties on the Jordanian side. Furthermore, in a letter to the editor of the Jerusalem Post, 
published that morning, four, four Jewish intellectuals condemned the military action, demanding that the government conduct an inquiry to discover who was responsible for the murder of innocent civilians. They argued that this sort of retribution showed that the country had abandoned its moral principles and scorned Jewish values. The reprisal operation, Ben Gurion claimed, was a legitimate alternative to judicial proceedings given that the per perpetrator could not be brought to court as he had fled back across the border. Ben Gurion implied that, a preferred judicial, that he preferred judicial action to military violence. Reiterating time and again the nature of the crimes committed against the Jews, he expressed his anger at the rape, murder, and robbery that Israel had failed to prevent. Philip Fisher, in his examination of how emotions are perceived in Western thought, shows that anger is the passion that remains under constant supervision because it is liable to lead to violence. Fisher argues that Homer, Plato, and Aristotle believed that anger lies at the root of the intuitive perception of justice. According to Aristotle, the anger a person feels in the right sort of situation and to the proper extent is not a negative quality, but a good one. Worthy anger is not the anger arising from an insult to a person, uh, I'm sorry, to an insult a person has suffered because that would imply egoism, but the anger elicited by something that has harmed their social environment is an expression of the sentiment of caring that is central to ties between people. And Martha Nussbaum maintains that there are cases in which anger is a fitting response to injustice and acts of severe violence. Anger in such suitable contexts, she proposes, constitutes a system of defense against injustice. Thus, the anger provoked by what we experience as an unjust injury to those close to us can be a constructive emotion. Ben Gurion's language shows that his anger was aroused by what he described as an immoral assault on Israeli civilians, which also exposed the state's inability to defend its citizens. Ben Gurion's justification for the reprisal operation was therefore both emotional, exemplified by his anger, which moved him to demand that justice be done and rational, the violent response he approved, accorded with what he viewed as an acceptable and proportionate policy. The historian Benny Morris and a literary scholar Uri S. Cohen argued that the thirst for revenge was the principal motive for the reprisals. Tom Segev maintained that the Sharafat operation and others that followed it were punitive and meant to deter violent infiltrators. But he also agreed that the high price tag that the policy placed on Jewish blood was an indication of the thirst for revenge. But what exactly is the thirst for revenge? Homer's Iliad opens with its hero, Achilles, in a fit of rage. At first, he is angry at Agamemnon for having abducted his beautiful concubine, but the goddess Athena appeases him. Achilles' anger is fired up a second time when Hector, the son of King Priam of Troy, murder the Greek hero's beloved friend, Patroclus. His, ang he, I'm sorry, his anger turns into a passion for vengeance, which leads him to kill 12 Trojan captive. Finally, Achilles pursues Hector and kills him as well, ties his body to a horse, and drags it around Patroclus's grave three times so as to mutilate it. Then he leaves the body exposed to the hot sun. The focal point of Aeschylus' play, the Eumenides, the last of his Orestia, no, Orestia, sorry, Orestia, 
I checked. <laughs> Trilogy is the establishment of the first court in Athens and the shift from justice based on vengeance to justice based on law. After the protagonist Orestes murders his mother and her husband, Orestes, pursued by the Furies, the goddesses of vengeance, flees to the temple of Athena. The Furies seek out Orestes, Orestes and demand not only his life, they want to consume his flesh and drink his blood while he still lives, so as to cause him terrible suffering. Then they want to take him to the underworld where he will undergo further tortures. So if anger is manifested in an emotional overload that seeks an outlet in immediate violence, vengeance involves waiting, searching for an opportunity, and passion, along with the expect expectation of pleasure. The Furies crave the pleasure of drinking the life of Restus's blood. The relief of anger by means of immediate violence leads to a sense of release or satisfaction. The order that was disturbed is restored to its status quo ante. Although the transgressors get what they deserve, there is not necessarily any expectation that the person who commits an act of retributive violence will enjoy seeing the horrible suffering of his victim or that he will take pleasure in the surfeit of the punishment over the original crime. So in contemporary Western society then, the first unacceptable com component of the desire for revenge is its ex excess. The second is the innate pleasure the avenger seeks to gain from his act of revenge. While anger is roused by the experience of an event, meaning that it looks to the past, vengefulness is a passion that looks to the future. Ben-Gurion, in justifying the military reprisal in Sharafat, does not accept the explicit or implicit accusation made by his critics that the excessive nature of the response showed that it was motivated by a desire for revenge, or that it was an act of violence committed against innocent people, what Barish and Lipton called redirected aggression. He saw the reprisal as a fitting recompense for the crime committed against Israeli civilians. The Israeli cabinet's discussion of the action on February 8th began with a question from Minister of Justice, Pinchas Rosin. What happened yesterday or the day before with regard to the Arab village? Do we say it was not an Israeli Defense Forces detachment that did it? Did this thing actually happen and who did it? Underlying this question was, however, another question. Was it morally acceptable to conduct a violent action of this sort against innocent people, which was not posed explicitly, but reverberated in the justifications offered by the supporters of the operation? Moshe Sharet, then Minister of Foreign Affairs, explained that it was vital to stage a violent response to the murder, rape, and robbery in Malcha because it was not an isolated incident, but one in a series of events, like in a prior case in the area of Tzor Ayanishtaol, when a Jewish shepherd was once killed by infiltrators. There was an act of retaliation in the area. Then, too, it was a chain and link in a chain, and that chain stopped then. And the estimate is that it will be the result here as well. Ben-Gurion added that the goal was to impel the Jordanian army, the Arab Legion, to assert its authority over the population of Jordanian territory and to prevent infiltration so as to endow the border with meaning. Both justified the action by, by pointing to deterrence as a motive. When he appeared before the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, Ben-Gurion argued that as he had no way of bringing to bring the violent infiltrator to trial, it was incumbent on him to apply the violent conception of justice, which ostensibly, like a trial, was proportionate and rational. Ben-Gurion sought to construct the logic of uh, reprisal as a paralegal recourse 
intended not only to achieve justice, but also to avert acts of vigilante revenge. Ben Gurion's effort to place the state's violence on a foundation of logic and justice, just as the law seeks to moderate it, granted legitimacy to the concept of reprisal and delegitimized the feelings of vengefulness that menaced the social order. Ben Gurion went so far as to stress his opposition to the use of violence as a rule. We do not do such things joyfully, he said about the reprisals, meaning that he also objected to the sense of relief that reprisal brought with it, let alone the pleasure that is a product of vengeance. Ben Gurion did not display a thirst for the, the blood of the villagers of Sharafat. Instead, he gave free rein to his anger at the injustice done to the Jewish immigrant victims. It was a social anger that expressed commendable um, outrage at an injustice. According to the logic of at least some decision makers, the villagers of Sharafat were punished because they were perceived as sharing guilt for the murder and rape, that is, they were guilty by association, and also because it, be it was believed that the severity of the reprisal would deter future attackers. During Moshe Sharet's tenure as prime minister, a bus on its way from Eilat to Tel Aviv was attacked at Scorpion's Ascent on March 17, 1954. Eleven passengers were murdered. One child was shot and survived, but with a severe brain injury, and another girl survived because she was concealed under the body of a shot soldier and played dead. The public's feel feelings ran high. I, I found some texts of letters IDF soldiers wrote in the reports of the military censor. One soldier wrote, it's strange how massacre and pogrom follow us throughout our history. It's horrible because we have yet to overcome that. The heart of every citizen contracted when he heard this catastrophic news, and all the more so the heart of a soldier, his fists and his jaw clenched, perhaps in anger, perhaps because of his inability to, response, to respond. Another soldier displayed similar difficulty in coping with his feelings when referring to the incident. I must end this subject, my dear friend, because it arouses in me a blind thirst for revenge. A woman serving in the IDF wrote, what is the purpose of talking so much? After all, the entire nation is crying out for immediate revenge. The day after the massacre of Scorpion's ascent, Prime Minister Charette decided to refrain from a military response and to use the incident instead to spur diplomatic action. At a cabinet meeting on March 18, 1954, about two weeks after the attack, along with another attack on Kisalon, a mushav near the Jordanian border on the way to Jerusalem, Interior Minister Israel Rokach demanded that the government pay as much attention to what was happening inside the country as was what, to what was happening beyond its borders. He also warned that civilians urged by the opposition Herut party, the parent party of the current Likud, might commit acts of revenge on their own. Pinchas Lavon, who had transformed from a dove to a hawk, after becoming Minister of Defense, insisted on the need for reprisal. I understood the decision to prefer a political process right at the time of Scorpion's ascent, but the Jewish public is deeply depressed because we decided on a response that seemed to pass over this shocking incident as if it had, it had not happened. And it is hard for many to accept that. And if during the week there are a few more incidents on top of that, here a soldier is killed, there a guard, here a soldier dies of his wounds, and there is someone else, it comes together as a feeling that we are forsaken. In this situation, he believed that the only solution was, res uh, was a response that would restore to the public the feeling that it had a few months ago, that he, it has not been forsaken, and that its blood is not forfeit. 
Although Levon may well have been using the public's emotions to justify a reprisal operation that accorded with his views on security, it is important to consider his reference to blood being forfeit as a description of the public's feeling. In its statement, on the attack two weeks earlier, the government had announced that it would take the measures available to it to ensure that the blood of Israel's citizens will not be forfeit. The word forfeit embodies two messages. The first is that the government affirms its duty to protect the country's citizens, as Lavon implies. The second is tightly connected to the concept of reprisal and to the moral outrage that uh, Ben-Gurion expressed according to which the state declares the value of each member of its, of its society when it decides to punish someone who had harmed one of its citizens. So when the biblical author grants agency to the blood of Abel in the verse, then he said, what have you done? Hark, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The debt must be settled. The Hebrew language preserves this concept of a balance sheet. The word for blood is dam, whereas the plural form damim is a word for money. A debt may be collected in blood or in some other currency. The verb ga'al, meaning redeemed, signifies the settling of such debts. The verb shilem, to pay, is related to shalom, peace, indicating that peace cannot be achieved without attaining balance between the two sides. When the government declares that the blood of its citizens will not be forfeit, it is declaring its obligation to collect the debt on the injustice committed so as to maintain the social value of its citizens. The reprisal operations were targeted actions in, intended to balance accounts after robbery, rape, or murder committed against Israelis. After the retaliation operation against the Jordanian village of Kibya in October 1953, which left 69 Palestinians dead, including women and children, the policy changed and only military targets were attacked. This transformed the conflict from relatively low-level hostilities involving the civilian population into a confrontation in which larger forces were deployed and which led to more casualties. The governments of the adversary states became more involved and their need to provide an accounting to their publics increased, along with the international visibility of the conflict. The or Orestia presents rational justice and passionate blood vengeance as polar opposites. But in contrast with the tradition that opposes the rational to the emotional, Iskolas's play proposes a harmonious resolution to the contradiction. The Furies are not expelled from Athens, but receive a place of honor there and the authority to oversee the judicial process. In other words, as Leora Bilski shows, in contrast with the modern attempt to depict justice as purged of emotions such as, such as rage, pain, hatred, and vengefulness, Iskalas's views, Iskalas sees them as important to and constitutive of justice. Anger and the desire for revenge are emotions that provide the foundations for the sense of justice, inasmuch as they produce the motivation to demand justice. Nevertheless, justice requires that it, these emotions be restrained. In February 1954, the Knesset abolished capital punishment in the criminal law. The Prevention of Infiltration Law, legislated later that year, adopted the same principle. The law's gatekeepers, Attorney, Attorney General Chaim Cohen and his predecessor Yaakov Shimshon Shapira, as well as the liberal jurists Minchas Rosen and Izhar Harari of the Progressive Party, sought to fashion Israel's identity as an advanced nation. They thus placed killing outside the law. In 1955, two Egyptian Jews, Moshe Marzouk and Shmuel Azar, were tried as Israeli agents and hanged in Egypt, setting off what would be come to be called the Lavon Affair. 
In response, Yohanan Bader, a Knesset member representing Khirut, submitted a private member's bill to amend the Prevention of Infiltration Law to authorize the death penalty for serious crimes committed by infiltrators. As a legal act, the death penalty is attractive because it expresses the sovereign state's power and authority. Only it can legitimately weld justice to anger and to the desire for revenge. At the meeting of Mapai members of Knesset that addressed Bader's amendment prior to its placement before the plenum, Knesset spe speaker Yosef Sprintzak condemned the death penalty in general and maintained that the timing of the amendment was shameful. This is our revenge? Cheap? Levantine? What are we like, Transjordan? Yona Kese asked, is this a sort of vengeance response to the trial in Egypt? According to Mordechai Namir, what is placed before the Knesset now is a proposal to turn Israeli law into vengeance instead of justice. There has been nothing like this in any decent society. The amendment was not passed. As a political endeavor, the Israeli nation building process included emotional norms as well as cultural practices meant to instill them. Policy makers and many other cultural agents fostered preparedness, courage, and resilience in the population, endeavoring to create a sense of shared destiny, belonging, solidarity, and purpose, especially when an all-out war was looming on the horizon. During the state's early years, policymakers also led a slow, hesitant, and ambivalent process of inculcating a culture cognizant of Israel's international image while also seeking to instill discipline in IDF troops. They thereby displayed increasing re reservations about the emotional desire for revenge and about actions that could be interpreted as acts of, of revenge, which were seen as ill-suited to the Western modern moral image that Israel sought to acquire. Israel therefore indicted soldiers who had committed crimes, especially those who killed unarmed infiltrators, raped uh, Arab women, or mur murdered Arab children. Even if the punishments meted out to the men convicted of such acts were sometimes negligible, the courts condemned the urge for revenge and sought to uproot it. A similar effort can be seen in the Knesset's debate over the 1954 Prevention of Infiltration Law, and its a significant turning point in the military, political, and legal arenas came in October 1953 following the Kibia massacre when the IDF abandoned civilian targets in favor of operations aimed at military and police installations and increasingly took measures to avoid harm harming innocent civilians, especially women and children. The effort to repress the emotional urge for revenge sought to fashion the Israeli citizen as a person who controlled their emotions and acted rationally and properly. It was an intended to project to the world a progressive image of Israel's moral identity, just as a few years after the conclusion of the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, one of which instituted protections for civilians in wartime. The aspiration to act in accordance with the sense of justice is particularly char characteristics of modern societies, which invest much energy in questions of morality and justice. Israel, at the height of its nation-building process, was no exception. So my new book addresses one aspect of the emotional culture of the Jewish national community in Israel, the way Israelis coped with security challenges in the first two decades, when Israel's territory was constricted and it enjoyed international legitimacy and aid. The 1967 war in which Israel occupied the Golan Heights, the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip marked a strategic turning point on both the military and diplomatic fronts. It also had a profound sociological impact on Israeli citizens who now who now controlled a subordinate Palestinian population that enjoyed no civil rights. Israeli culture in general, and particular its emotional culture, went 
sweeping changes.